All right, today we're going to talk about anthropology. And I'm going to introduce right here. Anthro is um, derived from things in the living species that are jointed. joints in their wrist, hands, elbow, shoulder, knee, and the pelvis. And it is a, a prominent feature of people to stand up because of the, the pelvic joint that allows the design of it uh, for people to stand upright. And it's believed because of this evolutionary aspect of people, it was able to free the hands. And then the hands were able to pick up something for making tools and developing uh, means of communication and uh, getting to know other people, uh, forming societies in a very uh, particular and special way. And so anthropology means the study of the advanced jointed system that made humans. And it is a, a discipline that includes the study of culture, languages and the fourth aspect is uh, primates and as part of the culture aspect we have ethnology Technology is a study of a specific group. And basically, um, the cultural aspect of anthropology uh -huh. as a study is akin to the American school and the British uh, social anthropology. And there is a, a difference in the study of culture and the study of societies. And then the study of societies then brings us to sociology. So within the realm of the humanities and social sciences, anthropology tends to be more uh, qualitative, and sociology tends to be more quantitative. That means in sociology, people might use questionnaires and break down data statistically or in terms of anthropology, using the tool for the study of culture with ethnology, uh, we are looking more at uh, long-term in-residence in a village or a community, a society, a place where people are living. And for that length of time, we get to know how the culture works. So primarily, I am a cultural anthropologist. Uh, that is my field, and I include some archaeology. What is archaeology? What do archaeologists do? Dig. Dig, yes. <laughs> Dig. Yeah. Archaeology is a methodology of uh, discovering the past, primarily through digging, excavating, uh, going into ruins, uh, temples, and looking at uh, debris in trash sites where people have tossed their trash in the midden or something. 
when they're having their uh, shell lunch. And they'll eat the shellfish, toss the shells behind them, and it forms a big midden. You can find those around the Plate Basin. Okay, so archaeology is, uh, is the study of culture of the past and then languages. And I've given you this, uh, this it says some uh, remarks on the use of the Austrian languages by uh, Robert Lust. Because the, and he is a linguist. Uh oh. Yeah, we, we can put that up later. It's okay. You don't need to do that right now. And it's believed, as I mentioned last time, that the Austronesian language family uh, is, uh, of course, the most extensive. And it also has uh, nine branches that extend out through the Pacific as the Malayo-Polynesian languages. And there are nine branches or subdivisions found just in Taiwan. So it's believed that half of, we look at this tree, the A-N is the Austronesian, F is the Formosan languages, and the N-P is the Malayo-Polynesian. And according to this, uh, the Formosan languages are half of the language family. And that is why uh, Robert Lust and other linguists are interested in Taiwan, uh, finding out if, in fact, Taiwan is the earliest source of the language family, since there are so many of these uh, languages, half of the language family, just found in Taiwan. And then uh, linguists uh, who study languages and match that to the archaeological record. And with the, the sequences in archaeology using uh, what are those artifacts that are related to the language, then we can find uh, actually a date that goes back in terms of the oldest languages. The Austronesian languages also uh, are among the most numerous in the Pacific and across the Indian Ocean, so they are the, the most widespread language family and uh, has some of the most uh, uh, diverse languages yet. Uh, almost all of these languages have something in common that make them a language family. Okay, now we come full circle back to primates or evolution. Sometimes it's known as biological anthropology or physical. And this is to say that uh, people developed from a common ancestor, a primate, uh, that goes back two million to perhaps seven million years ago. And in terms of the development of a human, and if we just go back 100,000 years ago, we start to see modern human, as we know, uh, people as homo sapiens sapien, uh, evolving. And then just uh, perhaps uh, only 15,000 years ago, we see horticulture and 5,000 years civilization. So we are, of these millions of years of human development just in the past, a uh, few thousand years, we are actually accelerating in terms of the evolution of people. And probably uh, this acceleration is more um, pronounced in our own lifetime. Okay, so international means between nations, right? Between peoples. So in international means exchange between people and does not necessarily mean it's global. So we can have an international exchange between Taiwan and Japan. And uh, so it means that, that we select things and we use things that are international because we think they're trendy 
interesting, fashionable, but not necessarily globalized. They could be regionalized. And this also has been a trend. Localization. Yeah. Localization. And localization. What does that mean? Localization means where we are in our place. But what does the term mean to you? I want to say globalization. Yeah, okay. That, that the um, people say that globalization is not really the right word because we're acting global, but still the local focus is still there. Okay. So that means that either one is important, but the global aspect came across or was added to the localized. Right. Okay, that's a good way to put it. Everyone is living according to their sense of place where we are, how we live, and, uh, and the values, and certainly the environment that we live in. So no matter what we take from other cultures and abroad, we have interpreted those values according to our locality. Anthropology is a very recent uh, discipline. It, uh, it is just like a feather in the cap of a university. If you have a department of anthropology, that seems trendy. And um, it looks like, uh, just as I said, a feather in the cap. And many people wonder today, what is the use and value of uh, getting a degree in anthropology? What can you do with it? And as I mentioned before, our university does not have a department of anthropology. It has an institute and department of ethnology. So, so this part, and in Britain and in the Commonwealth countries, uh, there will be a department maybe of sociology or social anthropology, and not uh, the cultural. So cultural anthropology is mainly an American export for the study of culture. And it really belongs to uh, a select group of people who are interested in those things, not necessarily belonging to any mainstream uh, kind of uh, endeavor. Obviously, not everyone's going to be an archaeologist or linguist or to study uh, primate behavior, or to become specialized as a linguist. These are, these are fields that are distinctive, uh, specialized, and academic. But when we put them together in anthropology, we, when we put all of this together to understand uh, who we are, where we came from, what are the languages that people use, and there are about 6,000 languages in use in the world today. And about our past, and of course that's very important for UNESCO, for uh, World Heritage Sites. And then about our living culture and the cultural groups that we have. All of this uh, is holistic in terms of the study of anthropology. In the United States, uh, anthropology was founded by Franz Boas at the University of Columbia, uh, Columbia University. And um, he uh, was from Germany. He got to uh, the United States because as a physicist, chemist, he wanted to study uh, uh, the color of seawater. He went to uh, Newfoundland, Greenland, and uh, talk to Inuit people, Eskimo, and, um, and he found that they had a, a, a range of terms for the color of seawater, and so many terms that uh, he became interested in cultural perception. So then he came to um, study in British Columbia and uh, in Canada, where he could find um, people who made totem pole, who had uh, a way of life in the Pacific Northwest. 
and became a self-made anthropologist and started up the department at uh, Columbia where uh, his students like Ruth Benedict and Margaret Mead and uh, Alfred Kroger um, all became very well-known anthropologists and started the school and the trend that spread across the United States. So I think that, uh, and this only happened uh, three generations within, uh, from the late 19th century and through the 20th century to our present time. So it's a very recent uh, study, endeavor. And I'm sure that you are not interested in becoming an anthropologist. You might be interested in taking a class. When I'm in airports uh, and in transit and I'll meet someone and I'll be asked, what, what do you do? And I'll say, well, I'm an anthropologist. And, uh, and I get various responses to that. Oh, uh, what dinosaurs have you dug up recently? <laughs> and then I try to explain that dinosaurs uh, lived uh, 65 million years ago, and human evolution probably started 2 million years ago. And there's a gap. <laughs> so, so in cartoons, when you see people running around with dinosaurs, uh, like the Flintstones, you know, this is, this is, I mean, this huge gap of uh, space and time and the uh, complete different evolutionary characteristics of the planet. And otherwise, uh, people will say, oh, I, I, I know, I took a, a class in anthropology in college. Then I'll ask, well, then what do you remember? Uh, the teacher had a mustache. <laughs> What else did you remember? That's about it. So I feel very sad that uh, with all this uh, knowledge coming out of anthropology and even students taking a class or a single course about it uh, actually don't get much from it. And I don't know why. <coughs> because I find it to be uh, fascinating as a discipline, as a, something to study as I do. So the anecdote in the United States is that there are more Norwegians in Wisconsin than in Norway. And if you go, have you been to Wisconsin? And, and also their dialect and uh, the Norwegian they speak by Norwegian standards is considered archaic and uh, old fashioned. And of course that's because they went there, they transported their culture, they kept it. And as they kept it, uh, they did not transform as people in Norway. They become then part of the European community, and they share uh, cross boundaries in Europe and uh, more internationalized within Europe. But they're not going in that direction than they in Wisconsin. But there are many more people that living in Norway because people who tend to move out from their country uh, actually become a, a broader base than within their country. Any other? Yeah, I noticed that too. Yeah. Any, um, any place in the U.S., people are more nationalistic about their own country if they came somewhere else. Like I went through the Middle East last year and I didn't find necessarily average people to be very into Islam necessarily. But I would have assumed they would be, you know. And like I, maybe some of the people I met back home were more into that. Same thing with like Pakistan and other places I've been. And uh, yeah, I think because when you go to a different country, you're surrounded by everything else that's different. So you even more want to hold on to what you have. Mm. Yeah, that's a very good point. So in uh, 1979, with the Iranian Revolution, a lot of people moved out and settled in Los Angeles. And they speak their own language. They have their uh, way of life and their celebrations, and including uh, uh, their uh, ex-king's birthday, the Shah of uh, Iran, putting up all over their area big uh, billboards with his portrait, and uh, 
and honoring their, their old king and all of that. So even though they they have left their country, they have uh, 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 translocated to a, a new place with the values that they had, or even to uh, expand to uh, to even uh, produce values that they didn't have into a greater extent uh, to form their and keep their community intact. So we can also think about this, about the uh, people coming to Taiwan, uh, people from uh, Fujian, and when they arrived in Taiwan about 400 years ago, and they started settling along this plain, they wanted to keep their values, their so-called Han Chinese-ness, and their uh, religion, and especially the cult of Matsu. Matsu is a goddess, and uh, she has 67 titles to her name. She's about a thousand years old. She was born in a place called Meizhou, and a small rocky uh, coastal area in Fujian, and among fishermen, and started to work miracles, saving people at sea, and people started to venerate her, and she was simply a uh, a local saint around fishermen villages uh, at that time. But by the, the Ming and the Qing dynasties, she was being elevated to the emperors of heaven. And that was to bring in the, actually politically, the southern part of China into the north, especially under the Qing dynasty. And then when these people started around that time, 400 years ago, coming across the Taiwan Strait, they used Matsu as the goddess to have safe passage from the coast of Fujian to land in Taiwan and start up their life. So the oldest temples uh, mark the time of this early integration in Taiwan. And there's about 600 Matsu temples in Taiwan. And the people follow Matsu in Taiwan more than they do in Fujian. And even though um, the government is trying to prop up uh, her place of birth as a pilgrimage site for the pilgrims, they're Taiwanese. And so, uh, so actually then this whole idea of, of the religion and way of life uh, transferring to an outlier island of uh, Fujian province becomes even more uh, strong will holding on to uh, their uh, goddess than any other place in China and becomes an emblem of Taiwan. Okay, anyone's question about uh, anthropology generally? Yeah. I have a question. How does anthropology work today, like in, in practical life? Because all the stories I know is that, like, in the beginning there were people coming to an island in the Pacific Ocean or somewhere, and they were dressed up like Europeans or Western people, and, and the native people were probably just running around naked. They kept, like, the distance because they were just observing and, and trying to make sense out of it, and then suddenly they tried to find outlaws of the community to talk to them or, and some, or like, and get involved or assimilate or what is what is the is there a tendency in, in modern anthropology that is in practice? So the first tenet of anthropology is fieldwork, as you have mentioned. And um, and probably the most famous uh, field worker uh, who went to such an island, Samoa, is Margaret Mead. And she went there and stayed on the island uh, and actually following the methodology of uh, Malinowski, who was uh, from Poland and practiced anthropology in Britain, and he was on his way to Australia, and the First World War broke out, and as a, a citizen of Poland that was uh, in the war, and allied or became part of Germany, uh, then uh, he was barred from entering Australia 
and put on an island of the Trobrians, where he had to stay in his tent there, and, and he had to stay there for so long, he established this whole idea of long stay field work. And, uh, and studied the people and wrote a book entitled Argonauts of the Western Pacific. Was he the one keeping a journal about his private thing? Yes, oh. yes. Right. And, uh, and he, he contributed a lot and to the understanding that if you're going to do anthropology, you need to do field work. So when I started my anthropology, I went to uh, Sri Lanka and I went to a village, a remote village, and uh, I found my way there, and, and I had this big backpack. And uh, it was in the early 70s. And the people, when they met me, looking at my suit and this backpack, and they thought my pack was a, a life support system. <laughs> and they had come from space. And they, they were calling me um, Armstrong. I presume. <laughs> I said, no, Blundell. <laughs> and, uh, and they thought that I had really, you know, landed off the moon or something and to their village. And they wondered why I needed all this apparatus. And then they, I started wondering that myself. Because the, the chief invited me to live in his house, gave me food. I didn't need to have a tent. I didn't need to have my pots and pans. I didn't need to cook anything. I didn't need my dehydrated food. I didn't need my uh, water filter. I didn't need my mosquito net. So when I finished my field work, I packed all that stuff up and returned it back to the market in Colombo. <laughs> I said, look, I've never used this stuff to the merchants and returned it to them. And uh, because I just got in my sarong as the ordinary people and, and decided uh, to live barefoot. As they do. And, uh, but actually, then I had to live there for a long time. So, for each uh, field work that I did in Sri Lanka, for each project, I spent a year at least. And, and after the first year, then I was told, oh, by the way, uh, this has not been a typical year. We've had uh, a drought and a flood, a cyclone, and political unrest. Uh, next year will be much more typical. Wait until next year. <laughs> then I would be there the second year. And then they would have other things happening that, you know, uh, more unusual things happening even than the first year that I was there. And uh, they said, oh, no, 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 this, this, this cannot be. Uh, the culture that you want to study will come next year. Because <laughs> they wanted me to study their typical way of life. And so, but then I found out that this was a ploy to keep me there year after year after year. <laughs> and they kept me there, supported me, gave me rice and curry, and uh, for me to learn their language and uh, their belief system. And uh, year after year, I, I stayed there waiting for the typical year. <laughs> because in your ethnography, when you write it up, you want to write it the typical lifestyle of the people of that place, of that village, yes. And is that even possible, like for, you, for that, um, for you being a stranger coming into a community, is there not the, the problematic, um, the problem that people try to develop a culture that might not be there just to impress you maybe, or to, to push something that usually would not have been that way or something like that? Now that is typical. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. And, uh, yes, everyone tries to impress upon uh, the anthropologist uh, what they would like their lifestyle to be represented as in your monograph, in your ethnography. So that is very true. So what do you do? You record, recorded everything? I would, have, I would have, yes, mm -hmm. and I would have stayed there forever. Mm -hmm. Except my mother, she wrote a letter to me, and she said, you must come back for your sister's wedding. <laughs> and, uh, and that was the trick. 
because after I got back, I had to take a steamship and go to Singapore, and then, then I got a flight to Hong Kong. And meanwhile, I was picking up friends in Singapore, Hong Kong, and we, we came as um, a number of people to my sister's wedding and uh, an extended family. Uh, and my sister was impressed that I brought so many people mm. from especially Hong Kong, three generations. And then my mother said to me, oh, uh, now by the way, since you're here, you should check into the University of California for a bona fide education. Because how do we know what education you're getting in Sri Lanka? And even if you go to the university there, what does that mean? What does a degree from the University of Sri Lanka mean? All right, so what does, for example, for you, a degree from a university in Taiwan, what does that mean? So my mother felt it was better that I, I stayed in California. So then I went over to visit the Department of Anthropology at UCLA and, and uh, Buddhist Studies at Berkeley. And between the two, I, I put together a, a thesis proposal. It was accepted. I was uh, put in the graduate school. And my proposal was to get back to Sri Lanka for field work. <laughs> <laughs> so then I, I did my one year, of course, requirements. And then I went back for another three years for my field work, mm -hmm. on top of the five years that I had done before. Yeah. So I, I got to know the place pretty well. Mm -hmm. In the same village? I, not only that village, you know, I went, I went to different, uh, I wanted to do case studies, just as you mentioned, uh, not to get those people just representing their culture to me, specifically dishing it out as they wanted, but to get a more comparative study. So I spent one year with a, a Buddhist head monk. And this head monk, he was very uh, strict about everything in, in his temple. And then I, I, I went to study with uh, Abhaksnaka Nilami. He is the custodian of a Hindu Buddhist shrine. Nice. And then, then I spent the third year with an exorcist. And so my thesis was about how the perspective of a Buddhist monk, a lay custodian of a shrine, and an exorcist all claiming to be Buddhist and yet dealing with different spirits, different deities, and the Buddha in different forms. And yet they were all uh, practicing Buddhists, but yet in completely different fields and never meeting each other. They have completely in different uh, aspects of the Buddhist system, in different locations and, and different functions of which they dealt with different people. So I was the only one to have met them all and put it together as a, as a complete belief system in my uh, thesis. So in anthropology, it requires time. And in my study, uh, because I bonded with a, a village, and so let's say when the villagers went out hunting, uh, where I lived in Sri Lanka, they didn't do head hunting, but they hunted. And, and I found this actually very uh, amenable to, to understand head hunting in Taiwan from that experience. Because what they did, they, they hunted and gathered in the forest, but all this forest land would be contested. There are no boundaries and no ownership. So as we would hunt through the forest, we might come across other people's uh, horticulture or crops. And to my surprise, they would just help themselves. They would pick all the crops and... <laughs> now these were the decent, you know, Buddhist, you know, village friends of mine. And I, and I would say, well, why are you doing that? And he said, oh, no one's guarding it today. <laughs> <laughs> they said if there was a guard here, we would we'd be polite and just be friendly, have exchange pleasantries, and leave. 
but because there's no guard, then we help ourselves. And, uh, and in Taiwan, headhunting was a matter of if you could hunt in other people's territory and come back without losing your head, then you expanded your hunting grounds. And so it was a contested um, uh, area between uh, boundaries that were fuzzy, of which people could expand their territory uh, by successfully uh, taking the resources without losing your head. And if you lost your head, then it meant that you were unsuccessful in the expansion, or other people then could encroach upon your territory. So headhunting was not uh, the intention of the hunt. Uh, Gananathal Besaker has a book out entitled Cannibal Talk. And it's, it's just that cannibalism is talking about it. What is cannibalism? Does it exist? I mean, there's a word for it. Cannibal means to, to eat other people. Cannibalism, and we put the ism on that word, means a belief. Like Buddhism is Bud, awakened belief. Commercialism means the, the belief in doing commerce. So is there actually a cannibalism, or has it been invented? Do you know anyone who is a cannibal? Have you heard of anyone in that belief system who partakes in that belief, in that church? So then where is it? According to Obesekura, it is simply the talk about it. It's a rumor that the other people are doing it. And when it does happen, it's because of necessity. And actually, there isn't any belief in eating other people. There isn't a church or a temple or a, or a, a, a kind of a, even a belief system. With the belief system, you must have the, the rituals, the mythology, the liturgy, the, the text, the, uh, all the trappings of a religion. So many of these have been made up. So one of the reasons for the development of anthropology is to find out, are there rumors of cannibals, or do they exist? So then anthropologists, they try to find out who are those cannibals and live with them. And in terms of all the ethnography, living so-called with cannibals, no one ever got eaten. Not even the ethnographers. <laughs> so, so, so this is this is the kind of thing, and and so your question is, if you are, let's say, a vegetarian, and you want to to do an ethnography with uh, Tibetans, now the Dalai Lama, of course, is he's, uh, he's very funny uh, because he eats a lot of meat, and yet he's Buddhist. And in, in Taiwan, if you're Buddhist, you don't eat meat. You, you become a vegetarian. And this is the, the term uh, ahimsa, that means in Pali, the language of the Buddha, uh, you are nonviolent, and you don't do uh, harm to any living thing. Well, what happened in Tibet? They don't have vegetables. They only have grass and uh, livestock. So they eat the meat. And that's their custom and their way of life. Now what happens if you're a vegetarian and you go to, to study uh, with Tibetans? You won't be very successful. You know, it's uh, like being a vegetarian and going to Orchid Island. They eat only fish. And the men every day they go out, take their boats, and they catch fish, and they have a, 
uh, a roast on the beach. Drink beer, next morning go out, catch more fish, have a roast on the beach. And the women are growing the taro and yam in the fields. And they have wild pig or something running around, they raise pig sometimes. And that's all they eat. Fish, taro, and pig. Well, you could only eat taro, but then people would think you're silly when you have all that fish. So if you're going to do your ethnography, if you don't partake in eating fish, especially uh, as, as a male with other male fishermen in that context, you're not going to get very far in your ethnography. So primarily, you need to do what the people do, and did as they do. And there was one uh, example uh, that I can cite in Sri Lanka that there was a student of anthropology, he got a Fulbright or something, and he went there. And then on weekends, he would go to the village and drive his car into the village. And then he would uh, get like a station wagon, put the, the tailgate down, sit on it with his typewriter, and get all the villagers to line up. <laughs> and one by one, as they passed, he would be asking questions and typing their answers. Then he packed up the whole thing and go back to Colombo, the capital city, and, and, uh, and, and he didn't really live anywhere in the village. He just wanted the data. And so in anthropology, we asked how um, evident is that data? How, how can we use the data when you simply line up people and ask them a question and type it in? So there has to be a kind of uh, language training, rapport, living there, to be there with the people, to partake in their uh, anniversaries and for uh, the occasions that the people are celebrating with them. Yes? But how valid is data if someone practically moves into a community after five years? Because I, I see on when I travel, at the beginning everything seems so new and like after a while you get used to things and you don't really, they don't strike you anymore as, as different or awkward or, or new because you get used to it. Is there not a risk that after a while one is too integrated? Yes, uh, that is very true. So I noticed that when I first went to Sri Lanka in the first year, I was taking notes everywhere. But the longer I stayed there and everything became so familiar to me that I was taking less and less notes. I was more just living in the life there rather than note taking everything. And that's true, if you go to a place in a short time, uh, you might get a lot of impression from that experience and a lot of notes in the first uh, part of the time that you stay there. It's like that a lot with photography, I notice. When you first get to a country, you take a lot of photos in your yeah. first few days. Right. Then you don't think about it as much, and you might even see some new things. Mm -hmm. And they'd be great photos, but you already got a lot in the first few days, so you don't think to get all the new photos in new areas. Mm -hmm. I noticed that too. It's kind of the same idea. Yes, uh, eventually you're going to integrate to a degree where you're not going to be taking notes and finding everything fascinating as uh, it happened when you first arrived in such a place. That's very true. So anthropology takes a long time and many years of commitment to that. And there's the kind of salvage aspect to it. Because as uh, when Franz Boas uh, went to the Pacific Northwest, uh, he, he was studying with the people who were already um, acculturated into uh, the commercial British Columbia way of life. So, also there was a photographer by the name of Edward Curtis, and he has 
a fabulous book about the American West and, and chiefs with all their feathers and regalia and people in, 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 in the Pacific Northwest in their war canoes and, and, and also he made films. And then it was discovered uh, after everyone admired all of his work um, from the late uh, 19th century with this big box camera and everything. In order to get those pictures, he had to make sure that, that everything was perfect in each picture. And he dressed the people according to the, the chief's regalia and the feathers and the buckskin and the beaded things. And, he even built the, the war canoes, had them commissioned for the people to sit in, dressed in their costume, and then he would photograph it. So it wasn't like he was photographing things in nature as they really existed. And also, and completely uh, to the opposite degree, uh, Franz Boas, he didn't find anyone in their native traditional costume. He found guys just in their shorts and a British uh, khaki shirt or something <coughs> in boots. And, uh, but he didn't care. He said, you, you follow your ritual, you, you chant, you, you go into your uh, trance, you communicate with your spirit. I don't care what costume you're wearing because they're gone. And so he's the first person to actually accept that things were gone and salvage what happened to be there. And with this training that I have, and, uh, and I would like to show you a film called Ishii, the last uh, American in California that was studied by Alfred Kroeber, a student of Boaz. And, and this man, anthropologist, the founder of the school at Berkeley, wanted to have a genuine Indian to study in California, and he couldn't find them. And then one guy walked out from the hills, Ishii, the last person of his people, and he couldn't speak any other language but his own. And he only knew his way of life. He was never acculturated into anything else. And then he became Kroeber's absolute study and placed in the museum as a living display with his stuff. And, and he found his stuff that had been robbed from him and his people in the museum. And he could recognize it. Yes. <laughs> and uh, it's a phenomenal story. And. Uh, the last uh, woman uh, in Tasmania, the Tas Tasman Aborigine in Tasmania, and she refused to die because uh, she said if she died, her body would be embalmed, her, her brain would be removed and put into a separate jar, and she'd be placed in the museum. And that's what happened to her when she died. And she was sitting there, and I think they and I went to the museum, and then she was still there, embalmed in the Tasmanian Museum of Natural History as the last Tasmanian. And she's there now, but this, uh, this was a, a trend in anthropology that you tried to, to preserve something, like a pickle. And then the modern trend is don't worry about the pickle salvage what happens to be there and try to understand it and let the people live their own life the way they're living it. So when I came to Taiwan, I did not even think of people living in so-called native costume or, or having any of these behaviors. They're modern people living in their village and doing as they like. And if I could live with them, partake in their lifestyle, that was fine with me. I had no expectations.
Yeah. I have one question about the role of the anthropologist in the field. Because I mean, if I read a book that you wrote about your time in Sri Lanka, I'm not reading, well, reality obviously doesn't exist, but I'm, I'm reading about your perception of what you saw. And this is a big deal, because if someone else goes there and probably spends five years there, he has maybe other things that he notices, or some, some things might be um, interpreted differently, or something like that. Mm -hmm. So how, how is that role of the anthropologist to be seen, or how is that to be evaluated? I, uh, I read a book, um, under the bow tree by Nir Galman, a Harvard professor who went to Sri Lanka and studied in a village. And I took his book and I went up to that village and I was reading and sort of translating what he wrote about them and they were laughing and laughing. <laughs> and he says, oh, weddings in this village. They don't exist. They go to the bush and come back wedded. <laughs> and they were laughing and laughing. Of course we have weddings and ceremonies in Buddhist monks who sanctify our weddings and everything. And, uh, and that didn't exist. So I wondered how, how he got that information. Aha! Among the Vedda, uh, an indigenous forest-dwelling people who also lived in that area, but at least two centuries earlier might have done that. And that had become a legend that he wrote in as his ethnography. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of controversy when you do a, uh, a study. Uh, Margaret Mead studied in Samoa, and then someone went there 40 years later and she studied the coastal people. He did the study of the interior people and found uh, her study to be wrong. He made a big deal of it. But he waited until she passed away and, and, and then published his book to, to uh, refute her findings. But of course, then he was living in a different time there. He was in a different place of the island. Uh, and among different people, and then he heard uh, rumors and stories about how Margaret Mead conducted her, her research, got her data, and all of that, and tried to um, uh, produce a work uh, to dispute her findings. But that's another way for anthropologists to become famous. If you cannot become famous, by your own ethnography, then you find argument with someone else's ethnography, especially if it's famous. <laughs> and, 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 and twist it, and, you know, go through, and try to get any, any evidence of false data from the ethnography. But because it's so elusive, who do you interview? Who's dishing out the information? Who is leading you into the understanding of the culture. And someone else will arrive and get other people leading them in different directions, getting other data, other uh, kinds of information. So uh, I think the best way uh, to avoid that is you don't work as an independent ethnographer. You get a team of ethnologists who do different kinds of skilled tasks in the village, who might study art or music or horticulture, uh, the religion, the language, and, and, you, and you study it as a team. But that is very, very difficult to do. Because how do you get a team of people, like seven, eight people, and you go to, let's say, a village in the east coast of Taiwan, and they might come from America, Germany, Sweden, all through China, Japan, all these places, and then you get them all to stay in the village, and then, then they will form their own little tribe mm -hmm. of, of ethnologists <laughs> in the village. <laughs> uh, international tribe. 
and then they start doing their field work, and then even their data becomes skewed just by their existence of so many people uh, living in the village. Then, actually, their culture then might be more significant than the village culture. <laughs> so, and they start importing things and getting their magazines and books and uh, and uh, you know care packages, what they need, what they like. And, and then their rubbish piles up, and and finally a number of people to make a study actually makes a better, bigger kind of uh, um, you know endeavor than one person. But then the one person also has the problem of the skewed information. So no matter how you try it, there's always going to be something wrong with what you do. And the alternative is, is don't do anything and just believe in cannibals. <laughs>